All right, the Psalms. We, we started this last week. Uh, we're going to, to look at a couple of verses tonight just to, again, to introduce it again. Uh, we will uh, watch the uh, video overview again, which was very good. I think you'll agree with me on that, just to kind of refresh in some things. And then we'll, we'll have a couple of touch points and, and then head into where we left off last week. Stand with me if you would, Psalm 1914 and Psalm 14521 sort of capture something of the, of the flavor and the essence of the Psalms. If you'll follow along in your Bibles or look on the screen as I read. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That desire that what we say and the reservoir from which what we say comes, our, our meditations of our heart, that it be acceptable to God. And then Psalm 145, 21, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. It, that's really, isn't that what we desire? If you can kind of distill it down, don't, don't those of us who bless the Lord and love the Lord, don't we long for all flesh to do that for the day to come? Uh, Think about how things would be changed just in this community, in this country, if all flesh blessed his holy name. It's our heart's desire. So help us, Lord, to study this tonight. We've just read together, what have we read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord press it to our minds and our hearts tonight. And we leave here having seen clearer glimpses of Jesus in the song. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that this, when, though the word, though this is an Old Testament book, which means it's in the Hebrew portion of the Bible, that the word psalm in the Greek uh, speaks of a song sung to the accompaniment of a plucked or a string instrument. It stretches over a thousand years, all the way back to the song of Moses, which is a song, all the way up to about 430 uh, B.C. And we'll see a little more of that tonight. Um, Michelle, would you show us the, the video overview, please? The Book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers that come from all different periods in Israel's history. Many of these poems are connected with King David, 73, actually, and he was known as a poet and a harp player. But there are many different authors behind these poems. There's the poems of Asaph, or from the sons of Korah, and some are from other worship leaders in the temple. Even Solomon and Moses have their own poems, and nearly one-third of these are anonymous. Now, many of these poems came to be used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, but the Book of Psalms is actually not a hymn book. At some point in the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient poems were gathered together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms before us. And it has a very unique design and message that you're not going to notice unless you read it from beginning to end. Now to see how the book of Psalms is designed, it's actually most helpful to start at the end. The book concludes with five poems of praise to the God of Israel, and each one begins and ends with the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for a command to tell a group of people to praise Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. Now, that's a really nice five-part arrangement, and it looks like someone's giving us a conclusion here to the book. So, it invites the question, does the book have any other signs of intentional design? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading book one, book two, book three, four, and five at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now, the reason for this is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen and amen. So the book has a conclusion. It has an internal organization into five main parts. And so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning to look for an introduction. And what do we find? Psalms 1 and 2. Two, which stand outside of book one because most of the poems in book one are linked to David except Psalms one and two which are anonymous. 
Psalm 1 celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on the Torah, prayerfully reading it day and night and then obeying it. Now, the word Torah simply means teaching, and more specifically, it came to refer to the five books of Moses that begin the Old Testament. And here, actually, the word seems to be used with both meanings in mind, which explains why it has five main parts. The book of Psalms is being offered as a new Torah that will teach God's people the lifelong practice of prayer as they strive to obey God's commands given in the first Torah. Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David David from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all those who take refuge in the messianic king will be blessed, precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example book one has right at the center a collection of poems Psalms 15 through 24 that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then, Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him, and God elevates him as king. Now, in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God. He will be delivered and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book 2 opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the messianic kingdom. Then book 2 closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the messianic king over all of the nations. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book 3 also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David. But now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book 4 is designed to respond to this crisis of exile. So the opening poem returns us back to Israel's root with a prayer of Moses. And he does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident, which is to call upon God to show mercy. The center of book four is dominated by a group of poems that announce that the Lord, the God of Israel, reigns as the true king of the world, and that all creation, trees, mountains, rivers, are all summoned to celebrate that future day when God will bring his justice and kingdom over all the world. Book five opens with a series of poems that affirm that God hears the cries of his people and will one day send the future king to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom. This book also contains two larger collections, one called the Hollow and the other called the Songs of Ascents. Each one of these collections concludes with a poem about the future messianic kingdom. And these two collections together, they sustain the hope for a future Exodus-like act of God to redeem his people. And then, right between them is Psalm 119. It's the longest poem in the book. It's an alphabet poem. Each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it explores the wonder and the gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. So here we go. The themes from Psalm 1 and 2, Torah and Messiah, combine all together here in book 5, which brings us all the way back to that five-poem conclusion. In the center poem, Psalm 148, all creation is summoned to praise the God of Israel because he has, quote, raised up a horn for his people. Now the horn here, it's a metaphor of a bull's horn raised in victory. And this image echoes back to the same image used in Hannah's song for Samuel chapter 2, but also to the earlier Psalm 132. The horn is a symbol for the future messianic king and his victory over evil. It's a fitting conclusion to this amazing book. 
Now, here's one more thing that you are likely going to miss if you don't read this book in order. There's lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms, but they all basically fall into two big categories, either poems of lament or poems of praise. Poems of lament express pain, confusion, and anger about how horrible the world is and how horrible the things are happening to the poet. And so these poems draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. There's a lot of these in the book, which tells us something important, that lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. But what you'll notice is that lament poems predominate earlier in the book, in books one through three. But pay attention, because you'll see praise poems occasionally, too. Praise poems are poems of joy and celebration, and they draw attention to what's good in the world, and they retell stories of what God has done in our lives and thank God for it. In books four and five, you'll notice that praise poems come to outnumber lament poems, and it all culminates in that five-part hallelujah conclusion. So this shift from lament to praise, this is profound, and it tells us something about the nature of prayer. As we hope for the messianic kingdom, as the book teaches us to do, this will create tension for us as we look out on the tragic state of our world and of our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives, but at the same time, biblical faith is forward-looking, looking to the promise of God future messianic kingdom. And so Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope. That's what the book of Psalms is all about. Okay. I just continue to be impressed with these fellows, what they've captured through their grasp of the scripture and their artistic abilities to visually sketch these out for us. What I want to do now, in the light of what we looked at, we, we went through 11 different types, categories of Psalms. Last week we ended, I said there were actually 10, but I, I was going to add an 11th. It's not a very popular type of Psalm, it's the imprecatory Psalms. We looked at some of those where, where the, there's this call for judgment. And we're going to shift uh, beyond that tonight, and I want us to take a look at the, uh, some issues about these five books, the collection of these five books that make up the book of Psalms. All we're going to do is we'll take them book by book, okay, just, and just real some, some observations that I think will be helpful to you. First of all, book one, if you have that, see, so we'll come on down a little farther there, Michelle. There we go. Book 1, Psalms 1 to 41, and with, obviously with the, with the caveat that verse, Psalms 1 and 2 stand out from that section, but Psalms 1 to 41 are considered to be included in Book 1. The chief author of the Psalms, even though Psalm 1 and 2 are anonymous, the chief author of the Psalm is David throughout these. We make the mistake sometimes. We talk about the Psalms of David, and he does, he's not the author of, of all 150 Psalms, though uh, we'll say, show in a minute that there's 73 clearly attributed to him, and there's two that may be referenced of him. So he may have actually written 75, half of the book of Psalms. 41 Psalms in, the, in this collection. The basic content of it, they, they constitute these, these songs or prayers of worshiping God. Then uh, I found this, which I thought was very interesting, a, a topical likeness to the Pentateuch. Remember, there's, there's five books in the Psalms which seem to correspond to the five books of Moses, the Torah, the, the video referenced that. The topical likeness to the Pentateuch, to the five books of Moses, is Genesis. This first book uh, reflects a lot on Genesis and man and creation. Uh, we, we read to you last week Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a, is a classic uh, indication of this. What is man that you are mindful of him? When I, when I look up into the stars and consider the heavens, uh, so man and creation. The closing doxology, remember each, the section, each section ends with a, with language of praise. The closing doxology is in Psalm 41, 13. And if you want to, let's see that. Uh, it says this, blessed, you've got the, now, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. So the first book closes out, uh, the 41 Psalms with this, with this cry out to bless the Lord. 
Possible compiler of this section is David. Possible dates, about 1020 B.C. to 970 B.C. Then you have book two. Uh, book two, the chief author in here is, is David and Korah. So you'll see their, their names attached to, uh, there's, there's 31 psalms in here. The basic content as, as different from songs of worship or, or uh, prayers of worship in the first section is uh, hymns of national interest. There's a lot about the nation in this. The topical likeness to the, to the Pentateuch is Exodus with themes that recur in here of deliverance and redemption. When you look at the closing verses in this section, Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So this section wraps up with another one of these cries to, to, for, the, for the blessed Lord to bless uh, the earth. The positive possible compiler of this is, is considered to be either Hezekiah or Josiah. So a kingly contribution here. Possible dates uh, of this collection of Psalms, 970 B.C. to 610 B.C. Then that brings us to book three, uh, Psalm 73 to 89. The chief author of this collection, you, if you were listening to the video, uh, he said Asaph. Uh, Asaph is, uh, is another pronunciation of this particular individual, Psalms of Asaph. 17 Psalms in this collection. Uh, the basic content, again, like book two, hymns of national interest. The topical likeness identifies with Leviticus, the matter of, of worship and sanctuary. And you'll hear that theme a lot through these. The closing doxology in Psalm 89:52. Blessed be the Lord forever. So you, so you lose in this, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, but blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Possible compiler, again, Hezekiah or Josiah. And the dates, uh, same as, uh, as book two, 970 B.C. to 610 B.C. And that brings us to, to book four, which is Psalm 90 uh, through 106. The song, the song or prayer of Moses begins this section. The chief author in this collection is anonymous. We have 17 Psalms, we're not sure who wrote them. Uh, basic content is anthems of praise. It has a topical likeness to the book of Numbers with this emphasis on wilderness and wandering, the Lord's protection over his people. The closing doxology is Psalm 106, 48, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. You see that refrain returning from everlasting to everlasting and let all the people say amen, praise the Lord. Probably, uh, probably Ezra or Nehemiah uh, compiled these songs, but again, it's sketchy because we're not sure. Possible dates take us from 970 BC until 430 BC. And that brings us to book five, the last book, Psalm 107 through Psalm 150. The chief author in, in these, we have some Psalms of David, but also some are anonymous. 44 Psalms make up this section. The basic content, like book four, uh, is anthems of praise. But this book corresponds to the book of Deuteronomy uh, with scripture and praise. Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, remember? The closing doxology is Psalm 150, the entire Psalm, verses 1 through six. Let's look at this. This is, uh, we read this last week, but this is one of those fascinating Psalms and it really, to me, sort of wraps up the whole book of Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him. So, so look at what we've done so far. This cry to praise the Lord, then to praise him uh, in his sanctuary, in, in, his, in his dwelling place. Praise him in all of the heavens that he's created. Praise him for what he's done, these mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. You could, you could argue there that it's, it's deeds and nature or character. Praise him with trumpet sound. Now we're going we're gonna to bring to bear uh, just how do we 
praise the Lord for His greatness, His excellence, His, His majesty, His might. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Now, the, the psalmist is not here giving us a list of instruments to use in praise. What he's doing, he's, he's doing what you see happen several times in the scripture where Paul's talking about a matter and Paul ransacks the vocabulary of the New Testament to give us a sense of a, of a, of a challenge. Here, here we're, 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 they're just grabbing the known instruments to them. Now, the, the point being, there's not anything that makes sound that should not be turned to praising the Lord. That's how great he is. Let everything that has breath. So it's not just instruments, it's our very being, it's our capacity to inhale and exhale. Praise the Lord, all right? Can you pull that down a little bit. Is this on? Okay. The possible compiler is Hezekiah or Josiah. We've seen that before. And the dates, of course, 970 to, uh, to 610 BC. So, so this is the picture that we have of these five books. And one of the things you discover is that the authorship of the book of Psalms, like I said this earlier, spans about a thousand year period from 1410 uh, BC to 430 BC. And so with that picture, I want to just speak a little bit about, uh, a little more about the nature of this book. Uh, Think about the breadth of the subject matter in the Psalms. It takes up such topics as jubilation, war, peace, worship, judgment, uh, messianic prophecy, prophecies about the coming Messiah, praise and lament, and we, you saw that in the video. Very often, uh, these prayers uh, were set to, to music, the, the authors of the video says that it was patently not a hymn book. There's a lot of prayers here, but they were put to music as well. So I think you, I think you need to be careful about being arbitrary about that. That's why we titled it a, a collection of, of, of prayers and, and praise. It's a devotional guide for the Jewish people. You know, it was collected over time. It did not come as one, one book compiled, uh, but over, as I said, a thousand years this was collected. It came to be known as the Sefer Tehillim, which, which means the book of praises. Uh, almost every psalm, think about this, has a note, no matter what the subject matter, has a note of praise to God. Now the Septuagint, we've talked about this when we're looking at the names of these books. The Septuagint, this is the, this is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. The Septuagint, uh, uses the Greek word for psalmoi, and that's where, that's where we get our word psalms for this, for this book. It's also called the Psalterium, uh, a, coll a collection of songs. Uh, and sometimes you'll hear it referred to in, as the Psalter. Uh, and then the Latin title is the Liber Psalmorum, the book of psalms, okay? Authors, Think about this, uh, at least 73 of the Psalms are designated as, as a Psalm of David. I wanna to read to you, if you wanna, I don't think I have these on slides, turn to, uh, to Acts 4.25 and Hebrews 4.7. Now, we were told in the video, Psalm 2 is what? Anonymous, right? Look at Acts 4.25. Preaching of the early church. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Where does that come from? Psalm 2. And so, again, it may be that, that the early preachers of the New Testament understood that David was the author of that, 
or in the materials they had that David cited that. Hebrews 4, 7. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, a reference to a psalm that's otherwise considered to be uh, anonymous. So David will say, authored 73 to 75 psalms. Um, in Ezra, we have 12 by Asaph. Asaph. Um, he headed up the service of music. And in Ezra 2.41, speaks of the singers, the sons of, of Asaph. Uh, ten were by the sons of Korah. And there's some references to that. And so we're just going through, who's, who authored this collection of Psalms? Two were by Solomon. Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. One was by Moses, Psalm 90. One was by someone called Heman, uh, whose name is Faithful. That was Psalm 88. One was by someone named Ethan, whose name means enduring. Recognized as a wise man in 1 Kings. That was Psalm 89. The remaining 50, when you piece all that together, if you grant 75 to David and these others as we spell them out, the remaining 50 Psalms are anonymous. Traditionally, however, if you step outside the scripture, traditionally, some of those have been assigned or attributed to, to Ezra. We already talked about the date of spanning a thousand years from 1410 BC to 430 BC, so we won't go into that anymore. There's four things to remember when you're, when you're interpreting the Psalms. And I want to give these to you. It's important because of the type of, you're dealing with poetic language here. So, and within the poetic language, there is some historical narrative to be sure. But there's also imagery. So first of all, when the superscription, and, and you're, uh, I'm just turned here to Psalm 34, for example, of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. When the superscription gives the historical event, the psalm should be interpreted in that light. Studies have been shown that, uh, that in terms of, of the archeological information, uh, the textual material we have, that, that when they trace these things down, they often discover uh, the root for why it's described the way it is in the psalm. In other words, the superscription, I think I told you last week that in the Hebrew Bible, the superscription, above the psalm is actually included as a part of the psalm. It's a sign of uh, identity with the psalm. When this is not given, it's, it's very difficult to reconstruct the historical occasion. And so we, the, one of the uh, principles is don't assume historical context if you don't have it identified in the psalm. Secondly, some of the psalms are associated with with definite aspects of Israel's worship. Uh, let's just look at a couple of these real quickly. Look at, uh, look at Psalm 5, verse 7. This is a psalm that uh, we told us to the choir master. It's a Psalm of David, give ear to my words, O Lord. You remember this? Attention to the sound of my cry, my King, my God. That's, look, drop down to verse 7. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. Isn't it interesting? He's not saying that I'm going to come into your house because of my worthiness. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, I will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. So it gives you kind of a flavor of, of even of the posture in the worship of God in the Old Testament. A third principle to consider is that many of the Psalms use definite uh, structure and motifs. And you'll, you pick this up as you read through them. You know he's a psalmist in Psalm 42 and 43, which probably should have been kept together. It's an unfortunate uh, splitting of them. 
It's telling us about the, about the hunger for God and the, and the, uh, the susceptibility to depression when God is not near. Fourth, many Psalms anticipate Israel's Messiah and are fulfilled in Christ. So you have these what are called Messianic Psalms uh, that sometimes use language. I think we looked last week at Psalm 22 is one of those most obvious ones. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how it opens in Psalm 22. And they anticipate and then you see them, you see the, the anticipation of the Messiah in the Psalm fulfilled when Jesus comes in the incarnation. So it's just some some things to observe about when you handle the Psalms. What about the, the theme and the purpose? Well, worship is the one word that I think uh, you can bring down to distill. This book, I've, I've said this in the past, the book of Psalms was the, was the book of worship for, uh, for the early church. The book of Revelation, when we studied through that, remember? The book of Revelation is, is a book of worship for us. That doesn't mean that we should not use the book of Psalm. We use the book of Psalm with great profit. But it clearly was given to provoke uh, Israel to worship. I forget, it was, uh, just lost his name. Maybe it'll come back to me. One of the old uh, saints talked about how when he would pray, that sometimes he found himself in a, what he called a dry state when he tried to pray. I don't know if you've ever been there in the morning when you, when you try to pray and it's just, it's crusty. And he said, what I would do is I would just start reading through the Psalms. And in reading the Psalms, be, be provoked into an uh, attitude of worship and praise to God. We looked at that when we were studying through uh, Don Whitney's book, where he suggested, it's a book on prayer, where he suggested that you read, you take the uh, spread the Psalms out over, over 30 days and on a, on a given day of the month, <clears throat> uh, read, for example, today's the 30th. So read the 30th Psalm or the uh, 60th Psalm or the 90th or the 120th or the 150th to read that and just incorporate that into your devotional prayer life because it is a book that provokes you to praise and to worship God. This, this theme that runs through the psalm, that God is worthy of all praise because he, of who he is, of what he has done, and what he will do, that his goodness extends throughout all time and eternity. Think about that. It's, it's tied into, if you have a regular prayer life, it's tied into that. You praise God for who he is, for his character. You thank him for what he has done, what he has done historically as you look back at his mighty deeds. What he's done in your life, personally, in the life of those you know. And you thank him for what he will do. What is that? The promises. The promises. And so we, we talk about uh, his past promises, uh, his, his past, his past uh, mercies, his present promises, his future grace. And that's, you see that woven into the Psalms. They're a very personal response. The Psalms take on a very, a very personal flavor to the person and work of God. The Psalm continues to cry out. It's a, this, this theme that Jesus teaches us in the, in the disciples' prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You pick this, this tone up in the Psalms, this longing to see God's agenda fulfilled and the earth embrace it. There's a lot of reflection, surveying the, ma the mighty acts of God that comes up in the Psalms. Historically, the Psalms were used in the two temples and formed a part of the, the liturgy there, as well as indiv individual use of them. So if you're looking for keys to the Psalms, I would say the key word is worship. The key verses we've read, we read last week to begin and this week to begin, Psalm 1914, Psalm 145, 21. The key chapter, let's look over there, is chapter 100. Probably other than the 23rd Psalm, the 100th Psalm is the most uh, memorized of the, of the book of Psalms. It's a... Uh, 
It's a psalm for giving thanks. You hear it read a lot around Thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. This, this challenge that our voices are to be tuned with joy unto the Lord. That when we, when we uh, think about living life, we think about serving him with a glad heart. When we come into his presence, it should be with, with a singing heart. You know, the New Testament talks about uh, singing and making merry in your heart to the Lord. Know that the Lord, he is God. Know this. Be convinced of this. Everyone is susceptible to doubt. Doubt's not the unpardonable sin. But, but bring yourself back to what you know. Let me tell you something, folks. If we don't know that, that the Lord is God, then we don't know much of anything worth repeating. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. So he's the creator. And we are his. We belong to him. We belong to him by creation. We are made in his image. We're image bearers of the creator. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We're fed by him. No matter what you ate today, no matter where it came from, you were fed by him. He leads you beside still waters. He restores your soul. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. He prepares a table before you when your enemies encompass you. He says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Notice how it anticipates that the people of God who love the Lord will be found among the people of God. I don't want to cast aspersion on folks that are not here. I'm so grateful that you are here. But very honestly, when we know that we're going to be reading through a book that so highlights the character and works of God and anticipates the glory of his son. What else is going on tonight that's more important than that? It anticipates this attitude. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. Notice it's telling his character now. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. This, this psalm, perhaps more than any other psalm in the book of Psalms, captures the character of God, the goodness of God, and the, and the only appropriate response of creatures made in his image to him. Praise him. Be thankful. Rejoice. So Psalm 100 is the key uh, chapters there. There's a lot of psalms that would vie for that position. But you notice here that, that these, these central themes of worship and praise are woven together in Psalm 100 very nicely. Well, what about Jesus in the psalms? And this, this is a mammoth task, okay? And I had to decide just how long do we want to stay here tonight. But, uh, but we're, going to, we're going to try to do some things. I hope to provoke you to some study First of all, as we said earlier, many of these psalms specifically anticipate the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the one who would come centuries later as the promised Messiah, the anointed one. And so one writer that I read, I liked what he did here, and I'm, I'm borrowing from him, took, he says, the psalms like the four gospels give several perspectives on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I want us to see that tonight. And you can just jot these psalms down and just in your meditation read them. When you think of Matthew, who, who presents and portrays Jesus as the king of the Jews. Look at Psalm 2. We, we've cited that several times. It says, kiss the son. The, 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 the nations rage. The, the, the people plot in vain. They, the kings take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, against his his Messiah, and say, let us break their bands asunder. And then the warning comes, you better be careful, O king. You better kiss the son. 
lest he be angry and you perish in the way. He is set up as the king. Even though he's rejected by the nations as king, he is, he is set forth as the one who will crush them. In Psalm 18, he's the protector and deliverer. Psalm 20, he offers, provides salvation. 21, he's, he's given glory by God. The Lord speaks of his son. Psalm 24, who is this king of glory? Remember that? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up your everlasting arms that the king of glory may come in. He's portrayed as the king of glory in Psalm 24. Psalm 47, he, he rules in this kingdom of his. Psalm 110, he's the, he's the king priest. Psalm 132, he is enthroned. And that that's, corresponds to Matthew's description of Jesus as the, as the king of the Jews. In Mark, and we went through Mark not too terribly long ago, we pointed out how he's the servant. He's, uh, he came to, to serve, not to be served to give his life a ransom, he said in Mark 10, 45. In Psalm 17, he's the intercessor. He, he prays. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He's the, he's the dying Savior who has the sense of being abandoned by God as he bears in his body our sin on the tree. And the, you know how the tone changes when, when he says, the Lord has heard me. He's heard me. And then you, you almost pick up that movement that you see on the cross. When he goes from that cry of dereliction to it's finished, into your hands I commend my spirit. He's the shepherd in Psalm 23. Who doesn't know the 23rd Psalm? If you have any acquaintance with the Bible, there are people in our country who have the 23rd Psalm hanging on their, on their walls. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing that I need. So he's the shepherd. He's obedient to death, Psalm 40 tells us. He's betrayed by a close friend, Psalm 41 tells us. He's hated without cause, Psalm 69. And he has a love, he shows a love even toward those who reject him, Psalm 109. And then when you go to the Gospel of Luke, he's the savior of the world. Luke writes to uh, most excellent Theophilus is a it's a it's a Gentile fellow. He's a non-Jew. He's a he's got some sort of rank. He's he's appealed to as most excellent Theophilus. And you read in Luke about how Jesus has come. His his genealogy traces back to Adam, in Luke. In Psalm eight, Christ is made a little lower than the angels. He comes, uh, places himself, humbles himself. Psalm 16, Christ's resurrection is promised. There's the promise of his resurrection. In Psalm 40, his resurrection is, is realized there. And then in, in, uh, you can go on and on with this. In the Son of God in John 4. Psalm 19, he's the creator. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 102, he is eternal. Psalm 118, he is the chief cornerstone, a theme that is picked up again in Peter and in Paul. So you see throughout the Psalms, I, and my, my challenge would be as you read the Psalms, just read with, the, with an eye to seeing how they speak of the glory of the coming Messiah. How, how language is set forth that Jesus recites in the New Testament. Now, there are five different types of what are called messianic. And messianic, is fan, that's just fancy for psalms about the Messiah, messianic psalms, five different types. There's what's called the, uh, the typical messianic psalm. The subject of the psalm uh, is in some feature a, a type of Christ. Let's just look at a couple of references here. Look at, look at Psalm uh, 34, 20. a reference to uh, the crucifixion. We know that historically, traditionally, that the people who were crucified, that their lives were brought to an end by breaking their bones. You broke their legs, 
so that they would lose the capacity to support their weight. Uh, they would fall, their, their weight would shift dramatically, their arms would go up, they would be cut off uh, in the capacity to breathe, and they would suffocate. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. A reference anticipating the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Typical messianic, typical prophetic. The psalmist uses language to describe his present experience, which points beyond his own life and becomes historically true only in Christ. In Psalm 22, I can't reference that too often. It begins with the very words that Jesus cries from the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Then the third time is what we call indirectly messianic. At the time when it's written, the, psalm, the psalmist refers to a king or the house of David in general, but it awaits a final fulfillment. Let's, let's look at uh, Psalm 72 just real quickly. It's a Psalm of Solomon. Give the king your justice, your righteousness to, royal, to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness, your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity. So you, you see that you read that and you're thinking, well, that's, that's talking about, about uh, Solomon. But as you go on and read, uh, you see that it's, it's, it's crying for something that extends beyond Solomon. Dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is verse 8. Desert tribes bow down before him. His enemies lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. Plus, Solomon is supposedly the author of this, according to the psalm. And he's speaking in third person the whole time. So, so you have these, uh, uh, these indirectly messianic. Then, then what we call purely prophetic. Uh, look at Psalm 110. This one you would be very familiar with, I'm sure. Jesus cites this when he's talking to the Pharisees. In Psalm 110, it's a Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord. Now Jesus cites this and says, why does David say that Yahweh says something to David's Lord. The Lord says to my Lord. Who's he talking about there? Who's David's Lord? If the Lord says something about him. And Jesus pushed this right upon the Pharisees and it, and it choked them. They regretted it and resented it. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And of course you can keep on reading that and you see this, this flavor that David has a Lord. And so Jesus' point is that the son of David is David's Lord. And then you have the, uh, the fifth uh, type, which is just what we call enthronement. There's, there's a collection of these enthronement psalms in Psalm 96. Let's just look over here, 96, 97, 98, and 99. These are rich. Listen, 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation. Declare his glory, for great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. And this, you have this, this kingly, ascribe to the Lord families of people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Say to the nations, verse 10, the Lord reigns. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. You say that? That image there. Verse, uh, Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. And on and on you get this picture. The Lord reigns. Psalm 99. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. This image of sitting enthroned upon the cherubim, of course the cherubim were etched into the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> Who sits enthroned? upon the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, it's, 
It's a powerful picture of, a, of an enthroned Messiah. So, so there's, it kind of gives you a, a picture of the, uh, the messianic flavor of finding Jesus in the Psalms. It's very easy if you read the Psalms. You don't get very far into it before you face him in Psalm 2. And he recurs over and over again. Now, the, the exercise I just decided not to do is to, we'll just look at a little bit of this, look at, at prophecy, the Psalms prophesying and the fulfillment of this uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. Look at Psalm 2-7. Verse 7, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, hold on to that thought and go to Matthew 3, 17. Matthew 3, 17. When you, of course, pick up at the baptism it's in verse 13, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And so he consented. When Jesus was baptized, verse 16, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. This, this anticipation in the Psalms, this fulfillment uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. Um, Psalm 8, all things will be put under his feet. Psalm 8, verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Okay. Now look over at Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. We'll pick up, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 5. Look, going toward verse 8. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It was, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him? You know what that's a citation from? That's Psalm 8. Son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So it's a quotation from Psalm 8. Then, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. So the Hebrew writer is explaining this, this Psalm, Psalm 8. And this, this goes, you could do this dozens of times, where the Psalms anticipate and the New Testament manifests the fulfillment of it. We cited some just in terms of, of, the, of his messianic recognition of him, betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41, 9. In Luke 22, 47, that happens. His betrayer's office will be, full, will be fulfilled by another, it's Psalm 109, 8, and in Acts 1, 20, let another take the place of Judas who betrayed him. He'll be a priest forever, like Melchizedek. Look at, let's look at this one, Psalm 110. Again, uh, Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then go over to... If you still have Hebrews marked, go over to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, 
let's just start in verse 1 to get your context for you here. We're, we're looking down to, to verse uh, 6 there. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when God, when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you see this, just Jesus Christ in the Psalms, the prophecy, the fulfillment happens over and over from the Psalms to the New Testament. Uh, so what about his contribution to the Bible, the, the corpus of literature that we know as the book of Psalms? The book of Psalms is quoted more times in the New Testament than any other book. More citations from the Psalm. Jesus cited the Psalms several times in his own earthly ministry. The Sermon on the Mount, you see this. Uh, encountering the, the Jewish leaders, cleansing the temple, doing the Last Supper, and from the cross, Jesus cited the Psalms. Singing of Psalms was a regular part of worship in the early church. I want you to, let's look at these verses here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. He's giving, telling them to have order in what you're doing, but you, you come with this idea of a hymn is from one of the Psalms. So, Ephesians 5, 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the Lord with your heart. And by the way, the psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, are not necessarily categories. Again, they're, they're examples of ransacking the language to show a comprehensive uh, and, and uh, encouraging approach to singing. And then Colossians 3.16, which we've seen, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to, in your hearts, to God. So, uh, the book of Psalms. It was used, I'll take issue with our, with our teacher on the video, it was used as uh, something of a hymn book, prayer book, praise book in the Old Testament. And it was the book from which New Testament saints developed their singing. You may not be aware of this. You're familiar with the writings of, <clears throat> of Isaac Watts, some of the great hymns of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts wrote two metric hymns based on each of the 150 Psalms, 300 hymns based on the Psalms. And the metric hymn, of course, is one that's put into a rhyming rhythm. They're beautiful if you get a hold of them to read them. There was a time when all the church sang a song. In fact, today, uh, some of our friends in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC, they still only sing from the book of Psalms. And they use, they use metric psalms from some of these writers who put, put it into, uh, into rhyming rhythm. Um, but it has a great place in the canon. Now, I need to tell you before we dismiss that uh, there are at least 11 other Psalms in the Old Testament. I just want to cite them for you real quick. There's, there's called the Song of the Sea, Exodus 15. The Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32. It's different from Psalm 90. The Song of Deborah, Judges 5. The Song of Hannah, 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 10. Uh, the Psalm of David, in, recorded in 2 Samuel 22. Job's Lament, throughout the book of Job, chapter 3, chapter 7, chapter 10. A doxology in Isaiah, Isaiah 12. Song of Hezekiah in Isaiah 38. Jeremiah's Lament, uh, which occurs in, in, in Jeremiah 3:19 to 38. Jeremiah 5, 
The prayer of Jonah in Jonah 2, 1 to 9. The prayer of Habakkuk in Habakkuk 3. Just that these, uh, the point is that, that the people of God throughout the history have cried out to God in these, these manners of praying and of praising and of singing uh, in lament, sometimes in joy, sometimes. Uh, it, is, it is within us. So the book of Psalms should have a very uh, forward place in our lives and our devotion, as I said earlier. If you have trouble with personal devotions, read the Psalms. They will provoke you. The writer I was telling you about a while ago said, I find myself, having read in the Psalms, I find myself being placed into what he called a happy state. <laughs> His heart was fired up to, to praise God and to pray to God. Questions or comments that you have uh, before we wrap this up tonight?